They woke the world to their magic and their wizardry transcends time. Many have passed on, but their heroics live forever. On football's greatest stage, the gods of the game have earned their encore. Pele, Beckenbauer, Cruyff, Maradona, Revered today by generations unborn when they weave their spell. In the streets of South America, up laneways throughout Europe, on the dirt roads of any African village, the deeds of the past inspire the players of tomorrow. It's the cup of hope. The cup of dreams. It's football's biggest prize on the greatest stage of all. World Cups can't be won by one person. Not even Pele in 58, Maradona in 86, or Zidane in 98. But when you score the only goal in a final, and that goal comes with a volley in the 116th minute to earn not just the trophy, but your third man of the match award for the tournament, there's no argument that you stand alone as the biggest contributor. That's what Andres Iniesta did in the 2010 World Cup final against Netherlands in South Africa. Though if you ask the man himself, there's no way he would claim the credit. I feel very proud to be part of this team. Proud of the supporters and, well, this little cup belongs to all of us. Thank you. Iniesta's philosophy on football was shaped by the tiki-taka style of his club team, Barcelona, where every player does indeed play his role, sharing the ball with short, lightning passes designed to confuse and unsettle the opponent. It's just that when the battle is at its fiercest, few have been able to do it like the little balding midfielder who loads the gun for others to fire the bullets. Not just man of the match in the final against Netherlands, he was also man of the match in the final of Euro 2012 and man of the match in the semi-final of Euro 2008. Even towards the end of his career, with his number of minutes on the park dwindling, his then Barcelona coach, Luis Enrique, summed him up. There are no players that are similar to Iniesta, not in my squad, nor in the entire world. That's the problem. I have very good players who could move into that position, and all of them could deliver for the team, both in attacking and defensive scenarios. But I have not seen anyone in the world similar to Andres Iniesta. Iniesta had many friends in his 2010 World Cup victory, but one is forever linked with him on football's greatest stage. That story, coming up next. Andres Iniesta was promoted to the senior Barcelona squad out of the La Masia Youth Academy at just 17 in 2001. He had a mentor just waiting to show him the way. Xavi Hernandez was four years older, had also graduated from La Masia, and had just broken into the Spain national team on his way to becoming one of the greatest players in the history of La Roja. The other similarity between the pair was their height, and Xavi no doubt saw something of himself in the way the young Iniesta was able to seamlessly step up through all the Spain underage national teams to the senior side. Initially at Barcelona, Iniesta was used predominantly as a sub, but an injury to Xavi in the 2005-06 season 
gave him the chance to start, and that led to his surprise selection at 22 for the 2006 World Cup squad. He played only one match, Spain's final group game against Saudi Arabia, but on the way to Euro 2008, he had established himself as an automatic selection. He and Xavi working together with an almost telepathic understanding. But they played together at Barcelona, along with defenders Carlos Puyol and Gerard Piquet, gave the engine room of the Spain team a familiar look. There are lots of similarities, because when the national team has so many players from one club, in this case Barca, it is inevitable that the philosophy and style and way of doing things is very much the one for the national team. So to sum it up, I would say that the style and way of playing is very similar to how we do it at Barca. But we also have alternatives coming from other players, which gives us other resources. Spain's trilogy of triumph, Euro 2008, World Cup 2010, Euro 2012, owes much to their dual puppet masters. Xavi was the player of the tournament at Euro 2008. Iniesta was player of the tournament at Euro 2012. And the World Cup? Between them, they won five Man of the Match awards. Spain lost its first match, and Iniesta was rested from the second match against Mino Honduras. But from there, the pair were unstoppable. Iniesta scored and was man of the match in the final group game against Chile. Xavi took over in the round of 16 game against Portugal. Iniesta dominated the quarter against Paraguay. Xavi man of the match in the semi against Germany. And of course, in the final, it was Iniesta. His winning goal after a pass from his friend from the Marcia youth days, Cesc Fabregas, also became a moving tribute to a lost Spanish soul. As he ran joyously to the sidelines, Iniesta removed his shirt to reveal a T-shirt underneath with the words, Danny Jacques, siempre con nosotros. Danny Jacques, always with us. Danny Jacques had been a teammate on Spain's youth team and was captain of Barcelona's other La Liga team, Espanyol, when he died from heart failure at just 26 the year before the World Cup. Iniesta earned a yellow card for removing his shirt, but his tribute earned him the admiration of all. He was favorite for the Ballon d'Or, but the FIFA award was, as usual, a Lionel Messi love fest, and he missed out. Although he finished second with Xavi third, to give Barcelona and the La Masia Academy a full podium. He also finished third in 2012 and fourth in 2011, but 2010 was the year he should have won. He and Xavi continued as a commanding duo until the end of the disappointing 2014 World Cup, and a year later, Xavi called time at Barcelona, prompting this emotional farewell from his fellow puppet master. Me, personally, I would like to thank you for all these years, not just for the magical moments that have been many, but for the day-to-day, -day, for how much you've helped me and all of the talks that we've had about things that are not about football, for being able to play together or apart, for being my teacher and teaching me. It's been a privilege to have you by my side. You are great. Thank you, Xavi. You'll always be with us, my friend. Of all the tributes to him that day, Iniesta's was the one which drew the most tears from Xavi. And having followed him for his entire career, soon it was Iniesta's turn to ponder the right time to hand over to the next generation. He became more of a bit player, but his presence in the squad was no less valued as he mentored the next wave of midfield maestros. Debates over who was better Xavi or Iniesta are as endless as they are irrelevant, for it was as a duo that they served Barca and Spain best. But in a World Cup final, 
the winning goal will always live longest on football's greatest stage. In a sport where vibrant, young talent often steals the attention, sometimes it's the old firm that holds the key to victory on football's greatest stage. Peters, but nobody gets past Dino Zoff these days. And there's been no better example than the great Azuri goalkeeper, Dino Zoff, whose feats of 1982 inspired his Italians to glory. Undersized as a teenager, a diet of eight eggs a day devised by his grandmother helped him grow. Starting at Udinese, six Serie A titles, two Coppas Italia, and a UEFA Cup with Juve, as well as a runner-up finish in the 1973 Ballon d'Or, built his legacy. Zoff debuted with the Azzurri in 1968, helping them win the 1968 European Championship. But success on football's greatest stage eluded him until near the very end. Zoff made his World Cup debut in 1974, when Italy didn't make it past the group stages, before an improved fourth place finish in 1978. In 1982, under Zoff's captaincy, the Azzurri famously didn't win a game in their group stage, but still progressed. In a match that ultimately sealed their quarter-final berth, Italy beat pre-tournament fancies Brazil 3-2, thanks to a wonderful hat-trick from Rossi and a marvellous late save from Zoff that denied Brazil's Oscar an equaliser. The clash was described as one of the greatest matches of all time. Zoff kept his second clean sheet of the 82 World Cup in the Italians' 2-0 semi-final win against Poland, and his crowning achievement was on the horizon. So when the Italians broke away from a stubborn West Germany in the second half of the final to win 3-1, Dino Zoff etched himself in history, named in the All-Star team, and the oldest ever winner of a World Cup at the age of 40. When he retired from the international team less than a year later, his 112 caps were an Italian record. That's since been eclipsed, but nothing can eclipse the memory of Dino Zoff clutching the greatest prize on football's greatest stage. Strange things happen on football's greatest stage. But there is something particularly peculiar about what transpired between 1950 and 1966. Between these years, each World Cup final scoreline had something remarkable in common. But do you know what it was? Find out after the break, when we also look at one of the most remarkable World Cup finals, the miracle of Bern. Welcome back. Before the break, we asked if you knew of a strange common theme that was present in every World Cup final between 1950 and 1966. In those five World Cups in a row, the team to score the first goal in the final went on to lose the match. Brazil scored first against Uruguay in 1950. Hungary even managed the first two against West Germany in 54. Both Sweden and Czechoslovakia took early leads against Brazil in 58 and 62. And then England came from behind to beat West Germany in 66. It wasn't until Brazil opened the scoring against Italy in 1970 that the jinx was broken. And who was the scorer to do it? Of course, it was Pelé, at the 18-minute mark of Brazil's 4-1 defeat of Italy. A bizarre fact, and one that provided plenty of drama on football's greatest stage. Modern World Cup finals have been very different to the era when the side that scored first lost five finals in a row between 1950 and 1966. 
In the seven World Cup finals between 1990 and 2014, only one, the 2006 final between France and Italy, saw both sides score, and even that was only one goal each. It's a far cry from the 1954 World Cup in Switzerland, an era of goals galore. The glamour side of the cup was Hungary, led by the freakish Ferenc Puskas and backed by striker Sándor Kocsis. They were able to conjure goals seemingly at will, evidenced by a haul of 13 goals in just two games against England in friendlies ahead of the tournament. Just watch the smart footwork by Pushkash. Then a free kick by Bosic, and Pushkash deflected the ball into the net. 4-1 to Hungary. The 1954 tournament produced the highest average goals per game of any World Cup tournament. 140 goals in 26 matches, an average of 5.4 per game, with Kocsis contributing 11 in just four matches leading into the final four of them in their group match against West Germany. The Hungarians were hot favourites to win the final against the same team, and they started with a flurry of goals. The first from Puskas. Only two minutes later, the German defence tumbled and Chibo went through with another. But if the Germans were stunned, they would fight back. Much the same situation near the Hungarian goal gave Germany their first chance. Morlock took it and the score was 2-1. Seven minutes later, from a nicely placed corner, the ball went to outside right, Brown, and Germany had equalised. The big surprise came six minutes before the end when a long shot from Brown gave the World Cup to Germany. Conscious was held scoreless. Pushkas had played with a fractured ankle, and Hungary had let slip its golden opportunity as West Germany won its first World Cup in the match dubbed the Miracle of Bern. Argentina has won two World Cups, the victories just eight years apart. But not only were the two sides very different, they were managed by two very different individuals. Cesar Luis Menotti, a striker who played only briefly with the national team in the 60s. And Carlos Bellado, a midfielder not good enough to play at all at international level. But both had keen minds and a passion to succeed on football's greatest stage. For Argentina, that fabled first World Cup victory arrived in 1978. It was the dawn of a new era under the management of Menotti, who garnered his passion from a visit to the 1970 World Cup. He fell in love with Pelé's Brazil, and his hunger grew stronger. Menotti played for five South American clubs and briefly in the US, also earning 11 caps with Argentina. His coaching career was more expansive, highlighted by the ultimate success at national level and a brief but fruitful role at Barcelona. After the 1974 World Cup, Menotti was appointed coach of Argentina and he developed a stylish brand. A goal should be just another pass into the net, he said. In 1977, he offered the world a taste of special 16-year-old Diego Maradona, who debuted in a 5-1 win over Hungary. Menotti would not unleash Maradona on football's greatest stage in 78, controversially opting for veteran Mario Kempes instead. And Argentina flourished, progressing to the second round as Kempes dominated up front. But they could not escape criticism, having benefited from playing all their group matches last. A 6-0 thumping in the final match of round two against Peru put La Albi Celeste into the decider against the Netherlands. The final went to extra time. But when Golden Boot winner Kempes kicked his sixth goal of the tournament in the 104th minute, Argentina led. Daniel Batoni sealed it in the 115th. 
and Argentina had its first World Cup. While Menotti's beautiful ideology that a footballer is a privileged interpreter of the dreams and feelings of thousands of people, his successor, Carlos Bellardo, was more defensive and unafraid to go beyond the realms of fair play. This was characterized during his time as a player, where he won seven titles with San Lorenzo and Estudiantes, and it continued into his days as a manager with his win-by-any-means approach renowned. Minotti was replaced by Bellardo after a disappointing 1982 World Cup. The new man perhaps finding a soulmate in Diego Maradona as they tackled the 1986 World Cup with one simple strategy. Win at all costs. The culmination was Maradona's Hand of God goal against England in the quarter-final. With his fist, he gave La Albi Celeste the lead and followed it up with the goal of the century, ironically with the skill that would have made Minotti swoon. The eventual 3-2 win over West Germany in the final was Bellardo's crowning achievement, delivering Argentina its second World Cup win in three instalments and proof that success can come in many forms. Maradona and Bellardo would fall out later in life, though their feud was nothing against the decades of bitterness that existed between the two winning World Cup coaches. Debate still rages as to who holds the key to the soul of Argentinian football, the free-spirited play of Minotti or the stringent tactics of Bellardo. Two very different paths to glory, for the good of the game or simply whatever it takes. One of Argentina's enduring mysteries on football's greatest stage. After the break, we reflect on the characters and the quirks that have come to life at the World Cup. In their own way, each and every World Cup is memorable, most of the time for the on-field drama. But there have also been standouts, not for what happened in the heat of battle, but for what went on around it. Anyone who heard the droning sound of the Vuvuzela, the unofficial symbol of the 2010 South African World Cup, will never forget it. Together in chorus, the sound of vuvuzelas has been compared to a swarm of angry wasps. Larger problems also emerged. And it was really noisy and it was so loud that people, that the players couldn't hear each other. Dutch coach Bert van Marwijk went so far as to ban the instrument from training sessions. However, some found them endearing. Then FIFA president Sepp Blatter claimed they were important to African tradition and allowed them to remain as a feature throughout the World Cup. The horns were even adopted and adapted by other nations. Love it or loathe it, the Vuvuzela made the 2010 World Cup one to remember. The giant ripple of the Mexican wave is now a common feature of all World Cup events. Indeed, just about every major gathering at sports of all sorts around the globe. It's argued the phenomenon of crowd participation originated in the United States. Other claims link it to Canada. But it was the World Cup that launched it globally. Of course, it was Mexico 1986. And now seen in stadiums from Buenos Aires to Belfast. England's performance at the 2006 World Cup in Germany isn't so much remembered for its quarter-final exit at the hands of Portugal, but for the wives and girlfriends of the players who were allowed to join the team in the exclusive Black Forest town of Baden-Baden. David Beckham's wife and former Spice Girl, Victoria. 
Cheryl Tweedy, then linked to left back Ashley Cole. Wayne Rooney's wife to be, Colleen McLaughlin. And Stephen Gerrard's girlfriend, soon to be wife, Alex Curran. With stories of shopping and fashion eclipsing the on field performances. The spectacle was even blamed for being a distraction that contributed to England crashing out in the quarters. So much so that in 2010, manager Fabio Capello only let his players see their wags after the tournament was over. Of course, wives and girlfriends of famous players have been making the gossip and celebrity pages for years. But 2006 was the year the acronym really took off and the WAG became part of football's greatest stage.